sexy on secular sexuality. Hello and welcome to Secular Sexuality, the ACA show with far and away the most references to 90s family sitcom Boy Meets World. I'm Christy Powell. My co-host tonight is a walking, talking, NB cultural icon. Welcome, Rudy B. Live long and prosper, everybody. <laughs> and our guest tonight is the organizer for Black Nonbelievers New York. Welcome, Kayvon Cameron. Hey, thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Awesome. So tonight we are going to be talking about racism and homophobia. So, uh... Put on your happy face and call the show at 512-991-9242 or tiny.cc slash call sex because the show is starting right now. All right, Kayvon, we spoke to Jenna Miu a few weeks ago about sort of the unique impact of purity culture on Black America. Uh, I'm curious what you can tell our audience about how the pressure on sexual purity might look different in Black communities. Well, it's um, from my experience, it's it's just a lot. I feel like it's it seems like there's this tendency towards everyone being exactly the same and this this sort of standard of not deviating from the normal the heteronormative you know standard mm -hmm. um even within the black atheist community a little bit not everyone of course but even within the black atheist community we see a lot of people just sticking to the standard heteronormative like this is what we do you can't you can't do anything else that sort of thing yeah so there's just a, a greater pressure maybe to to stay in line within a, a smaller community yeah yeah Definitely. I think um, it's seen as, as deviant or weird or um, one person even told me that that's a, that uh, that that being gay is, is European influences. So mm -hmm. I guess there's, there's a bit of like, you know, yeah, there's a bit of that in there. Sure. Well, so then how how does that purity culture carry over then to homophobia in black culture? Uh, well, if you are well, a lot of times, of course, you, you know, if you are you know, gay or bi or trans, you, you get excluded from your family. I mean, a lot of your viewers are probably familiar with that because they're in the atheist community, but um, yeah, um, it can, it can be isolating for a lot of people. Um, mm. And you just, it, it just doesn't, it just doesn't help build community, you know? Sure. Yeah. Uh, how have you noticed homophobia changing recently in black communities? You know, it, nationally, it feels like we are becoming more accepting. There's more representation in film. Like things are definitely not in a place that I'm excited about, especially when we start talking about trans folks and what we see coming through the legislatures right now, which real quick aside to the audience, look at what state you're in. Look at what's coming up in your legislature and get involved because, ooh, is it messy? Anyway, sorry, back to our conversation. Uh, have you seen much shift or, or change uh, in the last five, 10 years in terms of homophobia and black culture? I think it's definitely decreased. I think um, it uh, overall, in like you said, in America, it's definitely decreased and definitely within the black community. It's way less than it used to be, but still there, it's, it's still prevalent, unfortunately. Um, but going down, hopefully we can you know, change that a bit more today or mm. in going forward. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, how, how would you then compare queer acceptance in black culture versus the American culture at large? Um, I think in black culture, especially within the church, it's, it's much less accepted unless, I mean, what I've noticed is um, among people that I know who are gay but don't identify as such they as long as you don't say you're gay in the church they're sort of okay with that you sure know, that kind of thing um but there's it, a little bit more of like a don't ask don't tell type yeah, of uh, policy there they know but you know if as long as you don't say it no one no one questions it as long as you act a certain way mm -hmm. yeah, yeah you're you're not allowed to be like out and proud yeah. Uh, there was kind of something like that in my old church community as a Jehovah's Witness. Uh, there were uh, young people that I grew up with who definitely had characteristics and mannerisms and uh, ways of talking and acting that made people kind of like 
that's like a queer kid, but nobody said it. Mm. Uh, and they sure didn't say it. And when I came out to my parents as bi, uh, obviously I'm mixed. I grew up in a mixed uh, race household, but my parents unanimously pretty much took the stance of like, you know, you may be attracted to women, but you don't have to go around calling yourself bi. Uh, <laughs> it's like, but that, that that's what that means. Though. That's what that's what that's yeah. called. Right. Yeah. It's, well, it's a it's not a matter of whether or not the label applies. It's a matter of whether or not you choose to apply that label to mm, yourself. Sure. I I think is the 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 thing there. Right. And, it's very surface level. It's very um, behavior driven. I forgot the technical term for that. I know Matt Delancey references that all the time, but I forget the type, behavior versus ideology. I forget what that's called. Hmm. But it's definitely um orthopraxy, I think. That versus, might versus be it. A five dollar yeah. word. I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody correct us in the chat if we totally have the wrong word. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, it makes me curious then how uh queer representation in film compares against the wider culture. You know, uh in the like in the notes and in like the Facebook promotions and, and all of this stuff, I, I kind of crack some jokes about Tyler Perry, and I definitely don't mean to make him the sole arbiter or representative of black film culture, but I did have the very unfortunate experience of being forced to watch all of Diary of a Mad Black Woman a couple of months ago, and Jesus is that rough to watch. So it it made me really curious about uh what queer representation, what trans representation or, or these different things looks like in particular when we're talking about uh, black film or black media. Yeah, it's it's hard for me to speak specifically on that because um, that's uh, I don't identify as, as queer, but mm -hmm. um, so I'm not like always on the lookout. Mostly like what I notice is when something like someone says something or does something and it's like, mm, that's not right. Um, so I mostly noticed that, but um, as far as Tyler Perry, I've, I've been privileged enough to never see any of his movies. Um, <laughs> hey, congratulations. Um, but I don't see in general, just as like a, a, you know, a media consumer, like I don't see a lot of representation. I know there's um, that one character um, on Orange is the New Black who's trans and, and people like s mostly support like that one particular actor. But, mm -hmm. Cox, love her, but, love like, her. But like that's, that's the exception it seems. Yeah, uh, I, 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 I there's not a whole lot of of rep and it's in the same way that i've i've noticed that there's a lot of actors who are queer that don't specifically get mentioned as being queer because they don't look or act a certain way maybe they have heteronormative relationships that are public most of the time but like i remember the first time i heard like channing tatum is bisexual i was like hmm hmm well, what? that's a fantasy I did not what? know that I had. Okay, thank you for that. You're welcome, Christy. You're welcome. But I have found that that's the case with a lot of Black actors that I'm familiar with as well. It's like, oh, well, that person is non-binary, and I had no clue because they always get cast in female roles with female pronouns, and nobody seems to, and they're always referred to in interviews that way. It's like, if you're not like, Elliot Page about it. If you're not like fully like, I am coming out. This mm. is my big thing. Then it's like nobody just acknowledges it. You just you're just there. Yeah. Be you're you're there and you're being queer, but you're not loud enough to actually get labeled as a queer in the media. I don't know. Sure. Well, and it, it creates this uh, this strange dichotomy. Uh, it it feels like you know you mentioned Orange is the New Black, and uh, with shows like Pose on HBO and and these different things, it feels like there is a decent dish. You know, ha The Handmaid's Tale and and these different things. There's like decent ish representation of queer black folks, but in media that is uh is pretty bougie that is like largely directed towards a very white audience uh i don't know i'm curious i don't really see that kind of thing coming up on bet and i i recognize my ignorance here and i recognize that there's a, a lot more to the story 
But when I, I think about, uh, for instance, uh, like Dear White People or something along those lines, that strikes me as a show that's largely directed towards white audiences. And even if the uh, representation of queer black folks on that show is pretty positive, I, I'm curious how much of that is, is really uh, being given or shown to largely black audiences. And I, I don't know that we can measure that or, or how to even really wrap our heads around that, but it's definitely something that, that I'm curious about. Yeah, a lot of content is generally geared towards, I mean, black people are what, 13% of the country, a lot of content is just naturally geared towards, you know, non black people in general. But I think um, they probably most likely do a lot of, I mean, I used to work uh, for a market research company, we did focus groups all the time, I'm sure they do focus groups where they probably figure that, you know, black people aren't so interested in this content, and they're not going to push content um, towards demographics, they don't think will be profitable, mm -hmm. um, which is sort of sad reflection that, you know, they feel like, you know, we won't be interested in that type of content. And they might be sort of right on some levels. Yeah, it, it reminds me of the uh, the Sony document leak uh, a couple of years ago when it came out that there were all of these beliefs about whether or not black actors, for instance, could uh, pilot large movies overseas and will Chinese audiences accept black uh, stars and, and these different things. And the truth generally is, yeah, maybe not exactly at first, but if you put it out there, eventually people will come and it becomes this very like self-fulfilling uh, prophecy in a lot of ways. Yeah. Yeah. Like if you never try, try how are you going to know? And like you were saying earlier with uh, these sort of the, the media that does have black queer representation being marketed sort of more towards a white audience in the same way, I think that they are marketed towards a specifically progressive audience. Like if you're not already down with uh, black people and trans people and gay people, the, the, the rest of the show's content probably isn't going to interest you either. Um, is something that I've noticed. And as much as I enjoy those kinds of shows, I'm like, yeah, this is great, but the people who need to hear these messages, this show isn't really for them. Sure. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, these ideas about, you know, uh, focus group panels and, and the market research and, and all of this, I think just really serves to highlight that outside racism is a major factor on homophobia uh, within the queer community or within the black community, rather. And it is uh it's frustrating to know that you know a lot of folks are dealing with that sort of double damage in that way but i i I'm guess i'm wondering what that outside pressure might be looking like i mean a lot of it's uh religious pressure i mean it, it definitely it's not all religious like i said um i've ex i've met and dealt with some a lot of black not a lot a lot but some black atheists who are homophobic but i think a lot of it stems from religion and even with the black atheists i think a lot of that can also be maybe residual i'm not sure what their motives are or why they don't accept certain things but i think a lot of it definitely comes from religion and the way people are taught to to, I don't. I don't think if if we're, if we lived in a magical world where there was never any religion, I, it's hard for me to imagine there'd be homophobia. Yeah, I mean that's a, a fair point. Certainly not organized on the levels that it is. You know, I, that's a, a very complex anthropological discussion that boy, I'm not going to put the audience through tonight as I sort of like awkwardly stumble through it, but put a beer in my hand and sit me down in front of a fire and start asking me those questions. And yeah, we'll, we'll go to town for, for now. I, I definitely want to talk a little bit more about homophobia within black atheism, but I, I'm curious first and foremost, uh, Kayvon, as an organizer within these communities, what sorts of homophobia you're witnessing yourself or, or what some of those experiences have been that you've been uh, witness to? Well, um, as an organizer for Black Nonbelievers, um, we, in order to join the group, we ask a short survey, like literally like three questions. The first one is, uh, when did you become an atheist? And, you know, it's pretty straightforward. The second one is, um, because we're a 501c3, you know, we, we can't, we, we 
even if we could, we wouldn't, but we can't exclude anyone. So um, people who aren't black are also welcome to join the group. So, you know, we make sure people are comfortable. Are you comfortable with, you know, non-black members? The third question is about the LGBT community. And this is where a lot of people lose it. Um, um, I've had people respond um, with everything from, you know, that's, that's a European thing to, you know, I'm okay with that as long as they don't push their lifestyle on me type of responses. And um, well, now I know you, you people are all just ridiculous. That's, that's a crazy question. Um, so I don't, I don't know where that comes from exactly. Um, I would think, I mean, it may be a little delusional to think that just because they're atheists, they'd be super, you know, lefty, you know, open-minded, but that's sort of what I expect. Um, but yeah, those are the responses I, I've got. Some of the responses I've gotten from people trying to join the meetup group. Mm -hmm. Hmm. That is, oof. yeah. I this is something that I've actually brought up as a sort of a general question. Like this is something that I think about all the time, which is like, why are we members of a marginalized group marginalizing another marginalized group? Like, why, why are we doing that? And I've gotten different responses from different people who I've asked about that topic. And they're varied and interesting. But one that I, my own kind of pet theory is that in the same way you see a lot in the Black community, this sort of idea of, like, we got to stick with our own to the point of being kind of weird about black people dating white people or people of other races in that same way. Some seem to see gay people, trans people as a threat to population, which mm. is strange and a little eugenics-y, but, but that's something that I have observed. And it's, it's like I, I I'm, tr I'm just trying to pin down why this is happening, and that's one of the things that I've observed, and it's strange. Not to be too cliche, but I've always seen it as sort of that phrase that hurt people hurt people. You know, mm. when you're like when you've been hurt, you sort of lash out, and you're not so keen on making sure that the people you're lashing out against are you know deserve it. So it's the way I've always seen it. No, I, I think that that's a really valuable point here, uh, that when you do push people towards the margins, and especially if there is a lot of uh, just basic disparities in income and leisure time and stress and, you know, all of these kinds of things, people are going to be less progressive. People are going to be less open-minded. And when you have that very uh, like scarcity mentality, when you're pushed out to the margins, you just are more inclined to take from the people around you. Uh, can you speak at all towards that type of uh, pressure on uh, on black folks and, and how that might be playing uh, at play here? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think we've seen examples of like, um, especially within the black church of, of some black church leaders telling their, um, their congregations how to vote and like pressuring them that like, this is what we do because this is who we are. Um, I think it's just um, when you, when you're, when you're marginalized, it's just it, everything, everything becomes distorted and it, it's, it's just weird for you. So I, I think, it's hard. And the, the weird part about it is that as, as much as, like you said, um, we're not going to be as progressive when you are marginalized. I think it's sad because I think we as a community would benefit probably a lot more than other people from accepting this sort of more progressive mindsets, which mm -hmm. is really sad. Yeah. I, I've noticed that there is an interesting trend, at least again, as far as like voting and politics um, that a lot uh what from what i understand again this is just my own observations um uh, is that a lot of the black community is like yeah of course i'll vote democrat and then when lgbt issues come up there they suddenly become very conservative and it's like right mm -hmm. right like, which i think does very much stem from the church yeah i've always said black people aren't really liberal black people are liberal on black people issues like housing rights uh like um 
like mi- mandatory minimum sentences. But when you start talking about like abortion or LGBT issues or the environment, we can sort of fall off. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I, I remember that was a talking point, rightly or wrongly. That turned into a bit of a football uh, during Pete Buttigieg's uh uh, nomination process or, or uh, run for the nomination in this last election cycle, there was a lot of folks blaming Black America for his lack of access to the nomination. And I don't know how well founded that is, but there's certainly a, a reputation here, if nothing else. How, how earned does that reputation maybe feel? Mm, well, p- Black people do tend to vote in a similar way but i don't think the expectation should be that like we have to like we're not we're not a monolith as the expression goes like i think that part of the problem is it's like when you're voting for your own survival you kind of have the blinders on to just those issues because those are the most important ones to Mm. you those are the only ones that some people can at least in their own minds afford to care about uh because it is their it, it, it affects them, it affects their daily lives, it affects their family, it affects their future. So they're a lot more focused on issues of racial equality than any other kind of equality because, you know, that's the most important thing. And of course, there is, you know, the sort of stereotype of a lot of uh, gay white dudes kind of appropriating black culture, which wouldn't... S- you know, probably doesn't uh, engender great feelings there. Sure. Um, yeah, it's just kind of a a sticky situation all around. Sure. Well, I, I mean, pain breeds pain. Uh, that's fair to say. Um, I, I definitely want to talk a little bit more about uh, j- maybe lingering homophobia in black atheism, if, if we can even call it lingering. I think that's a lot to get into. Uh, and before we do that, I want to give Rudy a chance to take us to the calls and, and talk to uh, some of the people who are calling in. While Rudy's getting that pulled up, Kayvon, I guess I'm just curious if there is anything in particular that our predominantly white audience maybe doesn't understand about the stigma of homosexuality in black communities, or if there's anything that you might be able to just kind of highlight for the rest of us here. Uh just that it's a um, it's a complicated issue. Um, sure, we ha- like like I said, we're not a monolith, so we haven't figured. I don't think we figured anything out as far as this particular issue. Um, so it's it's just di- it's just difficult and complicated. And I know a lot of white people are always like, "Oh well, I can't really." Should I talk about this? I mean, even sometimes I think about certain issues. Should I talk about this? But I think I think it's okay um, to talk to people as long as you're coming from a good place um, and recognize that you know it's it's complicated. And just because you know you're white doesn't mean you can't talk about it. And just because you're talking maybe talking to a black person doesn't mean that they figured it out themselves. Yeah, that that uh, bigotry, no matter what community it's coming from, is, is bigotry, and we can be, you know, mindful of our own privileges and sort of aware of the conversation that we're walking into, if it's a, a community or whatever else that we're not a part of. But that ultimately, bigotry is bigotry, hate is hate, and that we have a responsibility to to acknowledge that or call that out. Yeah. Yep. Great. Uh, well. Rudy, uh, why don't you uh, take us to the phones, if you would? Absolutely. All right. We do have a caller on the line, Marcus. Uh, he, him from Texas. Uh, and he said he heard, uh, I made a comment about interracial dating slash marriage. And uh, he's wondering if Kivan sees some parallels between the discrimination of interracial dating and homophobia in the black community. Uh, but I'll let you expound on that question yourself, Marcus. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for taking my call. I love the show. Like I said, I, I kind of missed it when Rudy was talking about it. So it may be a little off track, but um, I, I, I wrote, I guess I wrote in the notes or told the call screener that I was cishet because I, I don't feel like I completely identify with the discrimination specifically Kavan might be experiencing. Um, but I wonder if there's any correlation. I mean, I am, I'm, I'm a 50 plus 
year old man. I've been married to my wife now for 25 years. Uh, my wife is white and I'm old enough to have experienced a lot of the very negative and even overt discrimination that comes with dating somebody outside of your race. Um, specifically and oddly enough, um, more from black females, I guess, than black males. It was always this, oh, look at him. He's a, he's a, I don't want, I don't want to repeat the slurs, but um, sure, I it was a very that. negative sort of attitude uh, towards dating outside of your race. And I'm, I'm happy to say it's gotten a little better, but uh, I'm just wondering, um, do you see, I don't, and I don't know if you have any experience with this, but do you see any parallels between, because I feel kind of feel like discrimination is to an extent discrimination. I mean, it is, it is kind of a unsubstantiated bias against somebody for some reason. So I'm just wondering if you see any, uh, might be able to see any parallels between those two situations. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for your call. Um, yeah, definitely. I think, um, I think like I was mentioning a little bit before that, um, like there's this sort of expectation of like the norm. And if you deviate from that, the norm, I guess, not for all black people, but for a lot is you're a black person, you date and marry another black person. And that's considered like the sort of blueprint, the sort of norm of what you're going to do because like white people, there's, there's a lot of what I've run up against a lot. Um, cause I try to take people like, I understand that, you know, there's systematic racism and a lot of white people don't like black people, but I do try at least to take people as individuals. And I've run up a lot against uh, a lot of black people who are like, no, they're just writing off all white people. Um, so I think that's, that's part of the, the, the stigma that's there. It's like, well, we can't date these people because, you know, they're all racist or they're all bad. Um, and it's just, con it's considered outside the norm, outside of that sort of, like I said, standard, what you're supposed to do. I don't know why some people are so geared towards being this sort of standard, like, let's be this stereotype, but it seems like a lot of people, and I suppose it's the same way in a lot of other communities that, you know, this is who we are, this is what we do, you can't deviate sort of thing. So yeah, there are definitely parallels there. Yeah, if I think, yeah. oh, go ahead. No, I was just agreeing, please go ahead. Yeah, I would say as somebody who has both done the interracial dating thing and the gay dating thing, uh, <laughs> it's... <laughs> Yeah, it's it's pretty similar as far as the discrimination goes because, well, I mean, really, it's uh, what we were talking about earlier. We were talking about how it's kind of a, a lot of times in the black community, a very obviously gay person is kind of like, mm, don't ask, don't tell. So nobody expects to see those people dating anybody. Well, dating anybody of a different gender, but at the, th there's always a couple of people I feel like who aren't in the loop that are like, "When are you gonna? When are you gonna find yourself a nice a nice boy? Mm. What are you gonna?" And it's like, mm, "Grandma, I don't like boys. Like, I don't know what to <laughs> tell you there." Uh, and in the same way that you know that that same grandma would probably be like, "Oh." Why are you find a nice brother to date? Why are you dating that white boy? Why would you? It's, it's, it's like it's like the same people. I feel like are kind of on that, and it's it's it, it is very much a tradition thing. It's a very much like a sticking to your own type mm -hmm. of thing. Uh, and I get the sense of feeling like you know we need to rally together. We only have each other's backs. I get that. But when it gets to the point where you've created these arbitrary rules of what your group is supposed to look like to the point where you are discriminating against your own because they don't necessarily fit that mold. Sure. Then you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot. 
Well, your, your question brings up for me, Marcus, uh, the, the fact that uh, the Obergefell decision that, may, that basically effectively legalized gay marriage across the country uh, heavily drew from uh, Loving versus Virginia as precedent. Uh, that uh, lawsuit that made it legal or rather made it illegal to have discrimination against marriage equality between races was later expanded in a way. And so I, I guess I'm curious, having had those experiences of being discriminated against for being in an interracial relationship and watching that cultural narrative like slowly, slowly, slowly get better, whether that gives you maybe a, a sense of hope when it comes to discrimination against uh, same sex relationships or if that feels like too fake of a, of a comparison to draw. No, I think it's fair. I mean, I've, I've definitely seen over the past uh, 20 years, actually, my wife and I have kind of been, if she heard me say 25, I'd get killed because it's actually 27, including the, the pre-married stuff. But sure, um, definitely uh, when we first got together, it was all kind of this very uh, looking down their noses at us. Uh, how dare he go do that? There's, there's plenty of, of strong sisters that he could be dating. Why is he going out with that person? Uh, but I've seen it very much um, shift into, uh, and I think it has to do a lot with normalizing um, that sort of a thing. I mean, uh, it's very much, and, and I'm, I'm even seeing it now on television, where it caught me a little by surprise and it kind of snuck up on me. But now I'm seeing a lot of like, interracial in commercials especially it's interracial families interracial couples and it's becoming a a normal part of our society mm -hmm. um i mean i'm even seeing uh i saw i watched i was watching one of the other shows uh and it was a, it was like just a furniture store commercial but at the end of the commercial it was two uh two gay men talking about yeah we went to the store they had everything i wanted it was great and then they they ended the commercial kind of on a still shot of these two um, standing next to each other. They were obviously, well, they were portraying that they were caring for each other. Um, and it seems like the more it gets normalized, I guess the less we get of the, the more, I guess the more overt discrimination against it. I don't think we're going to get rid of discrimination completely, but sure. Um, the more we get rid of it, and I think the more the younger generations are seeing this as a normal part of society, I think that they'll be less apt to pick up some of those those biases against ridiculous things, I guess. Sure. Yeah. Well, let's certainly hope so. It's encouraging to know that you feel like things are, are getting better, but there's, yeah, there's certainly still a lot of work to do here. Uh, Rudy, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, you're fine. Uh, it Piggybacking off of what you said, actually, uh, for every... Uh, furniture commercial with gay people in it there's like a face a facebook group full of white christian mobs that are like boycott this company they're putting out the gay agenda uh <laughs> and and that's still very much a thing uh surprisingly i remember um there's this cartoon network show uh that i watched when i was a bit younger and the uh, uh the, there's no not it's... actually but car but cartoon network is especially is especially it's going especially well with this but um uh it's called steven universe and like half the characters oh. in the show are alien rocks and they all are portrayed femininely uh, they're all voiced by women. They all have a vaguely feminine shape. But the producer of the show is like, they're rocks. I mean, if the <laughs> rocks are dating each other, it's just rocks. You know, let's not call. Well, yeah. We're not gonna. We're not gonna say it's gay. They're rocks, right? But it's like, well, this is obviously pretty gay. Uh, but <laughs> it's 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 like the more of that kind of thing. That's coming out, and that was very controversial. But at the end of the day, they're like, "Eh, they're rocks. We'll yeah. let this be on a yeah. kids' show. It's fine. Those rocks can kiss. It's fine." <laughs> uh, no, I mean, seriously, that was a big 
big controversy and, and it's silly thinking about it now and saying it the way that I said it, but it's like, it, this is becoming normalized. And the more, I think that some of these companies are kind of afraid to do it because there's always this ridiculous backlash about it from those Facebook mom groups. But at the same time, it's like the more we encourage that kind of representation, uh, the more spread thin those mom groups are going to be trying to fight the whole world changing around them. So it's I, I even though it, it's still a controversy, even though it shouldn't be, I think that we're still heading in the right direction. Hmm. It's unavoidable. Uh, society tends towards being more liberal and progressive, and companies know this. So, you know. yeah, let the rocks kiss. <laughs> it, it, it cracks me up just because as somebody who doesn't watch steven universe but who spends a lot of time talking about feelings to folks in the queer community it comes up a lot that show uh it's uh it's really beloved by a certain subsect of folks and uh there's money to be made there you know like i i don't want to make art entirely about that but we're, we're talking about tv right there's uh feels like a a real opportunity and Hopefully, increasingly, uh, marketers and everybody else will, will begin to see that. Yeah. yeah. It's like, hey, there's a whole demographic here that's just dying to be represented. We will buy all your shit if you give it to us. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, I did have one, I guess, other quick follow-up, and I don't want to steal any thunder for later in the show, but... Uh, Specifically for uh, Kavan, um, is there any? Um, I I like would like to consider myself an ally, an LGBTQ plus ally. Uh, is there anything specifically to what the show is tonight? Oh, any any um, anything I can read or any uh, reference material or any recommendations on how I can find out more, maybe of what Black Nonbelievers is doing in regard to this and possibly find a way in my own to get involved um as far as reference you mean specifically reference material for black non-believers uh for black non-believers or even for towards whatever efforts uh you guys might be doing for trying to combat this uh the uh discrimination that we're talking about tonight well i can't speak in general but for black non-believers i know we are extremely inclusive um and we we always uh go out of our way to make sure that um that not only lgbt people know that they're welcome in our groups that, but that everyone outside the group knows that that we don't discriminate um and we do m many events well it's it's been a while since we've been able to like really meet in person but um, sure. back in the before times um I remember doing um, an entire weekend for Pride Month where we did a, a gay comedy show on a Friday, and then we did a gay art show on a Sunday, and then we did the the, the legendary you know New York Gay Pride Parade on on the Sunday. So um, it's a lot of events. So you can go to our website. Um, I think there's a group near you. I don't remember all the groups. Sorry, I mostly remember like New York, Richmond, and DC. Um, but there are a lot of there are a lot of um, affiliate groups um, everywhere, and we we do a lot of events and um especially during pride month we we do pride events to um to represent great and i i know we'll be saying this uh, again throughout the show but that's all at uh, blacknonbelievers.org people yes. can and find that local group awesome yeah and it'll have a link for uh, for the group and for meetup too fantastic all right well well thanks thanks everybody for the call uh like i said i love the show and and i'm I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, Christy's uh, closing comments because uh, I love that. So anyway, yeah. cool. you guys. Well, thanks so much. <laughs> you have a right. great night. Uh, yeah. All right. Yeah. I I, I guess I hadn't realized that I appreciate the call out because I do do that, right? <laughs> like as soon as we hang up on somebody, I'm like, well, and I'll let me just add one more thing. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, j just thinking about uh, thinking about the struggle for civil rights and how the uh, struggle for queer acceptance is really built on the back of that in a lot of ways. I mean, we, I already drew that connection between Obergefell v. Hodges and Loving versus Virginia. 
it, it makes me wonder if there is any resentment maybe within uh, Black America because we, in a lot of ways, culturally have like moved on and we oftentimes are talking about gay rights when, to be frank, we've done a very shitty job of closing the chapter and actually achieving equality uh, down racial lines. What what can either of y'all tell me about that possible resentment or, or maybe even just frustration and aggravation that goes along with all of that? Uh uh, not to completely derail, but speaking of uh, racial equality, uh, guilty on all counts. Yeah, Yay! sure, fair to say. It's <laughs> one, worth bringing up. One good thing, but that's, uh, you know, speaking on that, uh, as a follow-up, I don't mean to completely steamroll you, Kivan, but I just had this <laughs> no. whole idea in my head, and I, if, I, no, if, I, if I don't say it now, I'm going to lose it. Uh, <laughs> A lot of what I have seen in response to, you know, uh, the Chauvin case was like, hey, so this is just one dude. Like, it wasn't a, a particularly egregious case, but this is happening every day, all the time. Literally, a girl got shot in my own state, in Ohio, by police, and she had called the police for her own protection and got shot by them when they arrived on the scene. You know, uh, uh, tensions are high within the black community as far as just trying to protect themselves, trying to advocate for themselves. And I have heard even, you know, like white comedians basically be like, what do gay people have to worry about? Like black people are getting shot in the street. You gay people can sit down and it's like, well, it's not that simple, but I see where you're coming from, from an outsider perspective. Maybe it does look tacky for us to be all like, yes, we're here. We're queer. And it's like, yeah, but you, but, but some of us are out here getting shot and stuff. So that's not, that's, that's not great. Uh, you know, the civil rights movement isn't over, obviously, but it's not just for racial minorities. There's other minorities that need that need civil rights, basically. Sure. Well, and a, a progressive tide raises all boats, right? Like I, I'd like to think that, but I, I do recognize that, as we've been saying, when you exist on the margins and when there's a real scarcity in your experience, that scarcity mentality, that notion that there's just not enough to go around means that you uh, you really hold other people back. Yeah, two, two points on that. Um, as you said, um, it it has like like things have gone amazingly well for the LGBT community in the past few years. Like I used to, like one of the con the thoughts I used to have is, oh, what if I have a kid and they're gay? Like, what kind of life are they? They're going to be like picked on. Is it going to be horrible? Now it's like, hmm, you know, not so much. It's like by the time I had a kid, by the time they were old enough to express any sort of real sexuality, I think society would be even more accepting than it is now. So it's not like a, it's not the concern it would have been like a decade ago you know mm -hmm. um now there's obviously the and ridiculous you know transphobia problem but you know hopefully that will also die down in in coming years um but also to the the second point um yeah i think when you're um when you are on the margins there's this sort of there can be this sort of like you know well you're not suffering as much as we are um kind of mentality a lot of times when not to compare, but when 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 I talk about like black people suffering, sometimes I'll reference like Native Americans because they have and and my point will be like not that we haven't suffered, we've suffered a lot, but Native Americans really like they like they're really not doing well. Like as bad as black people are doing, they're doing worse. Like their communities are are have been ravaged. It's 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 not a good thing. And I'll get a lot of pushback from black people. Like I'm not saying that black people aren't suffering. I'm just saying we have to recognize that like these are people too and they're suffering. So there can be a lot of that comparison of well, like, well, you know, sure, but 
that kind yeah. of thing. It's, yeah. it's not a struggle competition. We're not trying to say who has it worse. We all have it bad is the point. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody loses in a suffering Olympics. Yeah, I, I think that's a fair point. Yeah, yeah it, it reminds me of kind of this thing that's come up with the uh, sort of talks about minimum wage legislation in the states is, you know, there's people, there's college educated people that are like, uh, I really don't want to make the same as somebody flipping burgers. And it's like, then you should probably be making more. Like you get that, <laughs> right? You, you, it's not that the people flipping burgers don't deserve a living wage. It's that you should probably be making more than just a living wage. If you're doing more, right? Like why you don't take away from somebody else who's trying to get what they need to survive just if you think hey i should probably be getting more too advocate for that don't sure stop the people that are trying to get their own stuff hmm. yeah well uh rudy do you think we can grab another call before we wrap up the interview yep we have another call uh mark from stone church in mm -hmm. california uh before i get into your actual question mark what's stone church <laughs> Uh, the, and, uh, no, it's not really a stone church. It's, um, uh, a call back to Mark from stone church, a previous caller on, on AXP. Mm. I haven't heard ah. that. <laughs> wait, heard, wait, wait, wait. I think I years. remember, I think I remember this now, but you're not Mark from stone yeah. church, right? Okay, good. <laughs> no, Mark from Stone Church wasn't even Mark from Stone Church, quite honestly. Um, yeah, that's how so it is I, on I, AXP I a, quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, this is a different place. Uh, secular sexuality isn't the same as, mm -hmm. as AXP callers. That's why we're making fun fair of AXP say, callers. Fair to say. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, what can we do for you tonight, Mark? Uh, I was thinking about, I was listening to the show and I was just, it, this came up in my head the other day, how, um, I'm a, I'm a cis white het male, just get that out of the way. Sure. And I, um, but I've been to, I've been to a bunch of, you know, pride parades and festivals, uh, from high school onward, you know, well, I'm, you do live in California. Good time. So. Yeah. Well, I've lived all over the place, but, but, you know, people having a good time, feeling, you know, comfortable and confident and proud of who they, who they are, who doesn't want to be there, right? Unless you've got something, you're not, you're ashamed about yourself, right? If you can't be in those environments. And I remember saying, I was thinking about this, how there was a time and place where undeniably being out and bold and outrageous and campy and fun was maybe a stress relief, maybe a, mm. a release of, of tensions, a, a counterculture to this m main culture of you must be ashamed, you must hide who you are, right? And I know that that still exists in many parts of this world, right? I wouldn't want to deny that. However, listening to Marcus's call, it made me think also of, is, have we graduated to a point in at least American society outside of these enclaves of regressive, Bible thumping people who hate themselves. Are we at a point where it's better for the LGBTQ community, whether black uh, or other groups of people to be the boring couple in the furniture commercial, mm. right? Not the, not the wild people in gold sequins, hot pants, which I adore, but sure. the boring people, just going shopping like, oh, we got to get carrots. Why? Because the recipe calls for it. Okay. And that's the <laughs> idea that that pop culture is like, oh, yeah, gay people are just as boring as we are. Trans people are so dull, except when they're not, because I'm dull, except when I'm not, right? Mm -hmm. What have you guys have thought about, are we at a different stage in in representation? I think that's a fascinating question, and I can see Rudy absolutely chomping at the bit. So, yeah, yeah, let me let you jump in, Rudy. As someone who is super extra, just in everything, let alone queer representation. Can confirm. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I have thought about this a lot because... You know, I see some people that are like, hmm, why can't you just be normal? Aren't you trying to just be accepted as normal? <laughs> it's like, 
no, I want to be accepted as whatever the fuck I am, normal or not. And so do you, don't you? Like, if you do something yeah. weird, don't you just want to be accepted? If I, like, go around with, like, a... Like, if I walk around on a hot summer day and my only top is a binder and I'm just like, yes, I'm trans. Look at me in this binder. This is all I'm going to wear on the top half of my body today. And that's fine. Like, that's... <sighs> Like, like if I wear outlandish makeup or if I uh, insist on everybody using my pronouns, which, to be honest, in real life, I don't because I'm a baby uh, and it's hard to advocate for yourself sometimes. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> it's like uh, at the end of the day, it shouldn't matter how you present yourself. Because, you know, if if it everybody should be allowed to present themselves however they want. And if we have to be boring to be accepted, if we have to be like, we're just like you, it's, we're normal and dull. And we just, we just exist as like, you know, I, I th there's no, like, like if, <sighs> do you, did you watch the okay, movie I, Love, I, Simon? Oh, no, no. Okay. Uh, Love, Simon is a character who is as straight as a gay character could be. Like, as far as just everything else about the character, it, it was supposed to be doing a, I'm normal just like you. I'm just a teenage boy that also likes boys. And it's like, this is definitely for a straight audience, was what I thought when I watched the movie. Was like, okay... I get what you're going for. We're just like you, but I feel like we're past. We're just like you. We're normal. Uh, culturally speaking, maybe that's just me, but in exactly the same way that I'm tired of seeing movies where race is a main theme, where the point of the racial theme is just racism is bad. It's like, aren't we past mm -hmm. that? Can we, like do something a little bit more interesting a little bit more nuanced a little bit like can can we get into something a little bit more intellectually stimulating than racism is bad in the same way i want to tell i want to hear queer stories that are more than like we're just like you we're normal people it's like yeah i kind of feel like we're past that <laughs> Well, yeah, I was jumping I guess, at the bit. I apologize. That was a whole rant. No, no. <laughs> that's 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 great. I guess what what I'm, I'm think. Part of me feels I get the. I understand. I, I don't want anyone to act normal or boring, but part of me feels like the the concept that LGBTQ community is, like you said, extra, is flamboyant, is fabulous all the things that we celebrate at those at those festivals is a kind of minstrel show in a way for a group of people that are human beings with a full range of expression and that being gay isn't being woohoo happy days it's just being a human being it's just this one it's like being an atheist doesn't mean you eat babies right it's like yeah. <laughs> being being in that community or, or, or being an atheist just, doesn't make you a Satan worshiper in like all black. You know, I, I think mm -hmm. that might be the, the comparison right. here. Mm -hmm. And I, I appreciate cool. what you're saying. Cool. I, I think about my, my dad, who is a, who, who I love, who's a wonderful person without a hateful bone in his body, but who doesn't have a lot of maybe direct experience with, uh, with the queer community and, you know, when he was a teenager, he was fascinated by Rocky Horror. And that, I mean, he bought me my Frankenfurter sign that's on the wall behind me uh, when, when you can see it. And he had a totally different rep uh, relationship with that type of like really dramatic, bombastic, you know, Pink Flamingos piece of queer culture than he does with like actual gay folks. And I, I think that that's really relevant. I, I'm not a historian, but I, I'm fairly well aware of the fact that uh, racism 
became less overt and less uh, dangerous in many ways in the 60s and 70s as advertisers began to realize that black folks had money to spend. And I, I think that there was increased marketing and, and these different things because there was more of that that normalcy, that that boringness. Uh, and frankly, uh, Rudy, I loved love. I, I loved the film Love Simon because it was about a gay kid who was just a kid who happened to be gay. You know, yes, it was very much like a queer coming out story, and we can you know relitigate a four year old sappy teen heartthrob movie but in any case i i do think that we can be really flamboyant and have our our cake and eat it too but that ultimately mainstream acceptance of uh of gay rights of uh really trans violence getting away from that and everything else is going to come from just seeing people as people yeah I, I i totally get on board with that and i think that the way that i would sum up my thoughts is that as a queer person, I love the absolutely flamboyant, ridiculous queer culture stuff. It makes me feel seen. It makes me feel safe. It makes me feel part of something bigger than myself just for existing as I am happily. Mm. But for acceptance by uh, the world at large, by society at large, the we can be just like you is definitely more helpful. Uh, uh, <laughs> Little Nas X certainly wasn't making his Montero music video for anybody but other queer people because nobody but other queer people seemed to like it. Mm. <laughs> but uh, that's it. I I guess that that's kind of how I differentiate it is like who the, who's the target audience here? I guess. Yeah, it, it raises a. a bigger question about in politics whether you need to kind of push on both ends you know if you need like a very extreme end of the party uh as well as like a more centrist position in order to make your positions popular those are big big political questions that are, are a little bit beyond me and a little bit beyond our conversation here but i i think that they're definitely worth asking and i i really appreciate you raising them mark Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. And, and I think I agree with you uh, when I say, I mean, I, I like the video too, um, because of that in your face, uh, way of, of doing it. I, I just, there's lots of symbolism going on. There's, it, it was a, very artistically done. And I, I do think that, that the change that we need to continue to keep on pushing forward, forward is going to come from those different ends. There's a pushing, a pulling and nudging, there's the the conversations of look look I'm just a normal person and also I'm not going to hide I'm not going to pretend to be this this kind of person because it's the only kind of person that you're going to accept it's part of the the cultural heritage of the LGBT community in this country is is that right but I was just wondering if for efficacy and in the 21st century is that a because I you know I had play, spent spent a lot of time doing Rocky Horror as well. Right. Mm -hmm. And it seems like, of course, I'm older now, but it does seem like, like, like Rudy said, we're past the, oh, the, the, the character is gay and anti-gay stuff is bad. We're past that. And it still feels like that is harkening back to those days where hiding was, was the, the main thing that you did and not just the, 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 the subtle forms of homophobia and transphobia and stuff. Mm -hmm. And and that's why I, I just wonder if anyway, that's, that's just my thought. I wanted to hear what you all had to say and I wanted to hear what your guests had to say about it too. I think it, it can be, it can be both. Say. Sorry, sorry to cut you off, but I think it can be both. I used to listen to this um, radio show um, to your point, uh, Christy, this radio show with this guy who's now like closing in on 70 and he used to talk about his experience being younger and like his experience being younger was that all the gay people were, like they wanted all the straight people wanted to do what the gay people were doing because it's considered cool. Like they were the ones mm. push, pushing the envelope and doing the weird clubs and like having the fun. But I think it can be both. It, I think it has to be both. Like, um, especially if you're black, a lot of times, if you're not doing the sort of cool black guy things, you're considered not really black. Um, you know, I, I don't think that should, we should try to like pigeonhole what is gay or what isn't. I think 
If you want to be flamboyant gay, you should be flamboyant gay. If you want to be a normal, boring gay person, then you should be a normal. Or And if you want to be one sometimes and the other sometimes, I think that should be fine. I think we should promote the message that you can be whoever you want to be instead of this sort of, you have to be this sort of way. Hmm. Yeah. If I could add, as far as media representation goes, some of my favorite queer characters in media are characters whose most flamboyant traits have nothing to do with the fact that they're gay. Like, they're most sort of out there. Like, if you've ever seen Brooklyn Nine-Nine, I know, cops are bad, the show's funny, okay? Uh, but uh, the captain character is a gay black man, and he's his ex his eccentricities as a character have nothing to do with him being gay and everything to do with the fact that he always talks in a monotone voice and like uh it's like it's like the character's quirkiness does not come from their gayness like their whole quirky personality is not the gay part uh and that's kind of the sort of the middle ground that I kind of see as the best sort of meeting of those sort of like pushing the envelope, being a weirdo and being accepted, but also I'm just like you, you know, being gay isn't my whole personality, as I've heard some straight people say is the reason they can't support certain gay people is like, oh, you make being gay your whole personality. It's like, yeah. I mean, nobody's whole personality is any one thing, but whatever, but <laughs> You know, I, I, I used to know a guy in, in, in Rocky Horror that was his whole personality for a period of time. <laughs> Everything out of his mouth was... Well, I think I've met that guy, X. yeah. Okay, well, theater people, <laughs> people who are into musicals are a different... <laughs> they are a different thing. They do, in fact, make musicals their entire personality. That's just true. <laughs> like, yeah. like, like a Rocky Horror Daniel Day Kim? Like, method. <laughs> <laughs> like, all the time. <laughs> Thanks for thanks for for taking this this topic up. I, I I'll keep on listening and uh, keep thinking about it and uh, and and I like the answer that you know really to, to answer everything is that there's room for all different kinds of people mm -hmm. in in all communities and that you're not you're not stuck being one way or the other. And as we grow, as our society matures into adulthood <laughs> or continued adulthood. There's just going to be a, a lot more, like like you said, the, the the quirky captain whose quirkiness does not stem from his gayness; it stems mm -hmm. from his <laughs> monotone voice. I love that. <laughs> Sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, I meant I meant Daniel Day Lewis. I guess never mind. <laughs> oh, yeah, just, I, honestly, I, that's what I heard, that's what I heard in my head. But yeah, thank you. I think and, we uh, all and thank you, Mark, for, for calling. <laughs> yeah, thank you for the call. Take care. Thanks for having me. Bye bye. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it uh, it reminds me of a uh, conversation I heard with uh, John Waters, uh, the the famous you know filthy director and and kind of icon, as he was talking about the uh, I guess the lack of fashion sense among modern protests and uh, modern queer rebellion didn't have quite that same panache. And I I wonder if that isn't a, a good thing, but I, I definitely hear the question. So thank you all for, for walking us through it a little bit. Uh, I'd, I'd like if we can, though, to return to the interview and talk just a, a little bit about some of that, like maybe lingering homophobia that we see still in atheism, particularly in black atheism. I, I know that leaving religion isn't a single step, but as you were saying, Kayvon, it, it seems like even in the atheist community, this is something that, that kind of lingers. What, what have you experienced or what have you seen? Um, well, um, I used to follow a black atheist YouTuber. Um, I don't know if I should mention his name, but um, used to follow him. Call and, him out. Um, <laughs> he, he, he goes, I don't, I don't, I haven't seen his channel in a couple of years, but um, he, he went by em the Emperor Atheists um, and he had a, um, a YouTube channel. Seemed like a cool guy, you know, black atheist. They're not all a whole lot of them on youtube still somehow but um but he used to have like this channel well i guess maybe still has this channel and one day i see him talking about some sort of you know controversy about something he said on 
social media. So I'm like, I'm not big on social media. So let me go look it up. Um, and I look it up and I find a Rachel Oates video um, tearing him apart for his comments on social media because he saw uh, that a father had taken his 12 year old son to a pride parade and he apparently lost it and decided that this was wrong and that this was encouraging being gay. Um, and I just didn't understand the stance. I just thought like maybe wrongly, but I thought he was more enlightened than that. Um, so it was just weird to me to see this person who I'd like subscribed to and consumed just maybe like hundreds of hours of his content and thought mm -hmm. like, this is like a cool guy. And then to see him just ranting about something about just so weird, but yeah. Yeah, it always, always surprises me when uh, I hear from Black people who are in more marginalized circles, like atheists, like Black atheists, I feel like you're already kind of going to get stepped on by everybody else, and then you go and shit on another group. Like, that just never, never made sense to me. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I mean, we, we kind of poked around the edges of this. I mean, uh, I think Kayvon maybe made the statement that without religion, we might not have homophobia. And I, I don't know how true that is or isn't, but it does really beg the question, once you've left religion, what is some of the thinking behind this sort of bigotry? Uh, Rudy, you, you kind of pulled out the notion of uh, of reproduction, which just feels silly on its face, considering right. we've like completely doubled the population of humans in the lifespan of people currently alive today. Mm -hmm. And what especially considering that uh, half of those people aren't getting taken care of by parents anyway, the ones that sure. birthed them. Yeah, that's fair to say. So what what rationale can can we come up with here? What is some of the the thinking or at least some of the language that's being used around this sort of bigotry? The only thing I can think of is the the one comment that I remember reading about it being a European phenomenon. It may have some some racial elements tied to it where they feel like, oh, well, this was forced upon us. Um, there is some history I can vaguely remember about slaves being forced into homosexual acts um, that some people, like some super... I don't know, ponies the word hotep, but some super, you know, <laughs> some <laughs> some black people who consider them super black, themselves super black would, would go into. Um, so maybe that's that's a motivation where they feel like it's just it's just not it's just outside. I know a lot of cultures, like I think um like um was it was it Iran years ago? Um where they where the leader of Iran said there were no gay people there? There's just some cultures mm -hmm. where they where they feel like this is outside of us. This can't be us. So maybe it's a, a cultural, racial type thing. I almost did a spit take when you said. Hotel. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but yeah, I think that there's also, and this is something that we had talked about with Jenna when she was on the show, was that there is a culture of toxic masculinity in the black community that is kind of specific to the black community and the black community's idea of masculinity specifically that contributes very strongly to the homophobia that is in it very much uh yeah it typically comes with some misogyny mm -hmm. uh definitely comes with some ideas of macho-ness uh and gayness definitely doesn't fit into that. Not at all. Yeah. No, I, I think that that's a, a fair point. Uh, I'm not the first person to uh, to present this idea, but I was reading recently about the notion that when folks come to atheism, for a certain subsect of the population, it's because religion was not just toxic in, in sort of a vague and general sense, but was like very directly oppressive. You know, if you are a queer person who comes to atheism from a religious background, it's likely because you were told that you were going directly to hell. It's very likely that you were in some way threatened. Uh, perhaps things like conversion therapy or other pressures were, were put on your life. Whereas somebody who is not marginalized in those same ways often leaves Christianity or comes to atheism because 
Christianity just didn't make sense or it didn't like follow the logical argument. And, you know, that's there's no wrong reason to leave religion. I, I think we're all here watching this saying, yeah, if you left religion, great, good for you. And if you did it because the syllogisms didn't make sense, then great. If you did it because uh, you were being really directly oppressed, that's certainly a, a little bit different. And, and our hearts certainly grieve those things. But ultimately, it leads to a divide, I think, within the atheist community between folks who are much more privileged, uh, who are here maybe oftentimes to just dunk on Christians, are here to point out how brilliant they are for having escaped the, you know, the foolishness of religion, as opposed yeah. to some of the maybe refugees, if I can use that term, who maybe fled their own homes or certainly in a lot of ways fled their own community. And I, I think that that's a distinction that is often missed out on. You know, when I go through the comment section on, I mean, YouTube comment sections, I know, I know, I know. But when I go through the comment section on some of the ACA's uh, bigger shows where there isn't necessarily a effort in particular to draw in a queer audience, things can get pretty nasty. And I, I think that we need to recognize that there is a lot of homophobia uh, in the atheist community. And I think that, you know, the ACA as an organization has done a lot of work to grapple with the transphobia in our own past and recognizing that there is a lot of pressure against trans folks, even within the atheist community. What, what kinds of uh, things have y'all seen or, or what can you maybe hope for in terms of moving the, the narrative forward? That's that's a lot. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a lot uh, to take on. No question. I mean, as a as a moderator of uh, AXP and Talk Heathen, I can tell you there's been plenty of times when, I mean, I think I'm I I, I might have been the first mod to start doing this, but I had like a typed out little like these pronouns are they them not she her. Uh, and I would just like copy and paste that into the chat every time they got misgendered because it happened plenty. Uh, and now it's like an official Nightbot command. I don't know if I was the first person to start doing that, but I know that I started doing that at some point because I was just tired of it. I was like, I'm not trying to tell anybody they can't talk in the chat. I'm just saying that's not correct. And most of the time people were like, oh, my bad, thanks. But every now and then there'd be that one person that's like, well, sorry, you're trying to silence me, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, okay, you're just getting kicked out of the chat. I'm, I'm, not, too, I'm not doing this. Mm. And it's, it's just irritating when it's coming from, like, like, it's like I fled one oppressive community already. I, I don't need this. <laughs> like, I, 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 it's it can be really frustrating, really tiring sometimes. It can be very disheartening. But I have enough friends and allies within the atheist community that I know that they those people are not in the majority and they are not the loudest voices within this community. They're still prevalent, but there's plenty of people who will jump to shut that shit down. And say, no, that's not cool here. That's not part of what our uh, community stands for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we just have to put it out and hold people accountable. Especially if they're your friends, you have to make it known that this isn't this isn't cool. It's not acceptable. Um, and some legislation would be nice too. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it uh, it tends to be for sure. Uh, you know, besides, uh, you know, continuing to organize in the way that we have and, and form communities like the ACA, uh, besides like policing those communities and, and really working as, you know, as moderators or, or just as individuals to call out the transphobia, the homophobia and these different things as we see them. Uh, is there anything in particular that either of you can point out before we wrap up for tonight to to resolve some of these things, to continue to push the needle forward or to change the 
the homophobia within the atheist community. If there is something that I in particular wish for uh, seeing more of, it would be uh, your stereotypical cis white het male atheists creating more informative content about uh, about queer people, about queer issues. Like, I have a lot of friends who fit into that sort of very specific image of an atheist, uh, and they make lots of great atheist content, and they're great allies. Um, and maybe that doesn't exactly fit into their normal sort of stuff. But if we saw more of that, more pushback from the people who are in those marginalized groups taking on that uh, sort of emotional and intellectual burden, that would take a lot of weight off of my queer black shoulders, I'll tell you that. Sure. <sighs> yeah, I think we just have to, to keep pushing, keep hosting events, keep uh, putting the subject out there, keep having conversations like this. Mm hmm. Well, I appreciate, Kayvon, all of the work that you're doing in particular within the Black community. And uh, I, I'd love to give Rudy a, a chance to uh, call out some of those things and, and uh, just to hear from you about how people can get interested in uh, Black nonbelievers and, and what else we should know here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do we want to start by putting up all of Kivon's links for black non-believers uh, and of course, anything you want to say about what you're doing with the black non-believers right now. Uh, yeah. Um, you can check out black non .org. Um, We have a bunch of different uh, uh, affiliate groups in a bunch of different cities. Um, so check out black non .org. Um, And don't forget to donate. Uh, it is a 501 C three nonprofit um, emphasis on the nonprofit. Um, so don't forget to donate at black non .org. Um, Check out meetup also for black non -believers. Um We're trying to get back to some kind of normal. I just got my first uh, vaccine last Wednesday. So hopefully we can, we can, as far as meetups, we can start doing some in-person things mm -hmm. like, yeah, like coming up. Um, also uh, next Monday, the 26th at 8 p.m. Eastern time. I will be doing um, some street epistemology workshops with Anthony Magnum Bosco, street, in, street epistemology international and in association with uh, with American atheists. So you mm -hmm. can um, check that out. Um, the link should be available there also. Um, so yeah, that'll be cool. It's it's uh, it's basically uh, different levels, beginner, intermediate, um, advanced. There's some polling work. Um, it's a lot of different, it's like seven different workshops on on the different aspects of street epistemology, uh, which is a great tool. Um, if you know somebody who's homophobic, um, you know, maybe practice some street epistemology on them, see why they hold these beliefs. That's awesome. That is awesome. Yeah. Uh, so, Whoop. All right. We uh, lost Rudy's connection. We'll, we'll work on, on getting them back of in. Of course. Oh, 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 you yeah. are still here. Oh, oh no, okay. I'm here. Oh, I'm here. Oh, 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 oh. Okay, Rudy, bring us out for tonight. <laughs> oh, I'm still here. I promise. I'm here. Uh, <laughs> um, something kind of new we're doing. Uh, check out tiny.cc slash AEN podcasts. That is uh, podcasts rebroadcasts. Uh, that rhymes a little bit, sort of, kind of. Uh, basically, it is all of the shows that the ACA has done and is doing uh, in purely audio format. Uh, and all the shows will be all together there. So definitely check that out. Uh, of course, if you want to continue the conversation with us or with your fellow secular sex lovers, I don't know how to say that. Uh, yeah, we'll, <laughs> join stick with it. we'll stick with it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, go to a uh, Facebook uh, secular sexuality fan group. That is uh, facebook.com slash group sex slash secular sex F G. Uh, it is a fan group. It's not official, but you know, we're all there. We all hang out there. Come chat with us there and chat with your fellow fans, ask questions. It is a great place for conversation. Uh, another great place for conversation is the ACA Discord. Go to tiny.cc slash ACA Discord. Join us there. We're going to be there after the show. 
uh, taking a couple of questions. And of course, if you one of the ways you can support the show is at bit.ly slash AEN merch, buy some cool stuff. You can get a pillow and do whatever you want with that pillow. Uh, I won't go into any more details about that. <laughs> And lastly, uh, because last but lastly, most importantly, most importantly, not at all least, the best, in fact, let's go to the crew cam. Let's see our beautiful crew people. Oh, there's our beautiful crew people. We love them. They make this possible. They're the best. They're the bomb.com. They really, we wouldn't do anything without them. <laughs> They're the best. <laughs> <sighs> all right well with that. sex lovers by the way <laughs> yeah sex lovers that works yeah <laughs> i'm serious i'm seeing some great options in the chat secular sex or secular sexualist secularists which uh i don't know i think we're gonna need to keep workshopping this team, yeah but uh i do like the idea of uh you know uh, a sex x fan nation i don't know uh i guess regardless of what you call yourself regardless of your race or your orientation or even your beliefs we really appreciate you watching this show we hope that you learned something and we hope perhaps even more than that that you'll take a, a nice quiet moment to yourself and uh give yourself a big old orgasm or or better yet, better yet give somebody, give somebody else, else one, one.